Good morning, everybody. So we'll get going here. I'm Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of Libraries, and it is my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, this morning to our second installation of the Fall 2021 Graduate Research Series. So this series uh, celebrates graduate students' research and their experience during that research process, and also highlights the use of libraries and other research uh, materials uh, in the process. This series is collaboratively hosted by the University Libraries, the Graduate Student Senate, and Faculty Senate. And just want to take a moment and extend my sincere thanks to the Graduate Research Series Committee, which selects the speakers uh, for the events, and to our Libraries Events Coordinator, Jen Harvey, for her work in making this all go off without a hitch. Thank you, Jen, and the committee. This morning, I am very pleased to introduce Brian Costco, a third year MFA student in communications. Brian will be presenting on uh, his research for his master's thesis, through which he's bringing local Athens history to life, both through audio storytelling on his podcast, Invisible Ground, and through historic photos and augmented reality. Uh, the research has combined Brian's interest in local history and multimedia, and through it, he hopes to highlight local history in new ways uh, to reach a wider audience. So Brian, welcome. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Well, thank you so much, Dean. I appreciate the introduction. And I want to, before I get started, I want to thank uh, Ohio University Libraries, Alden Library for hosting this series and for Jen Harvey putting it together, as was mentioned there. You've been fantastic. And I also want to thank the OU Graduate Student Senate, along with the library who sponsor this award um, and allow people like me to get a chance to talk about our research. I also want to thank all of you for being here today. I know we're virtual, um, but it's also still very exciting to have people who have chosen to come here and hear about my work and this topic and some of the exciting things that I've been going into these past couple years or so, and specifically these past few months. Um, I get to speak to you about my thesis project, as mentioned, and a lot of the research involved with it. I'm going to do that for about 30 minutes or so here at the beginning, and then I'll be able to answer questions at the end. So, and I, I love questions. So I, I joked with Jen that I assume I'll probably have a bit more than I do with my first year undergrad class um, when we ask them if they have questions for anything. So please, if something I say um, kicks off a thought in your head or you have a, want some further explanation, so write it down or put it in the chat and we'll be sure to get to it at the end. Um, so I'm going to start off here in a minute by talking about myself and my MFA background, my academic background, and then I'm going to tell you a bit about Invisible Ground and my thesis project, and specifically, as I mentioned, the research into it. So I'm going to do that through the last little bit of my presentation by showing you a lot of photos, actually, that I've gathered both from OU libraries and other places. And I think for even people hearing about this for the first time, that's a really uh, good way to dive into the story. OK, so I'm going to do the old 2021 thing where I got to share my screen here. All right. Second. Share my whole screen. And then you should see my presentation. I think it looks visible on my end, but I always do like to ask. I just want to make sure that everyone can see that. I can see it, Brian. It looks great. Cool. Wonderful. All right. And I'll get more into what this picture is here in a little bit. It might look familiar to some of you that know a bit of Athens history or for some of you maybe that walked up Court Street on your way to wherever you're going today or or attended OU at any point. But I figured I should start with a bit of telling you about myself. And I'll, I really don't like to talk about myself too much, but I think it's, it's somewhat essential in understanding kind of how I've arrived at this project and where I'm coming from with my work. So I was originally born in Lorain, Ohio. Uh, I came to Athens in 2001 as an undergrad at Ohio University. So I have been here for just about a little over 20 years at this point. I graduated in 2006 with a social studies education degree from College of Education at OU. Uh, and, you know, I loved teaching. I loved history. Um, looking back now, that path sort of all makes sense how I winded my way here. 
But at the time, I wasn't quite sure if that's what I wanted to do. And that was timing up with the fact that there wasn't a lot of social studies jobs. So I stuck around Athens a little bit as people do, right? Um, I, I joked even in my notes here to, to mention that I at the time thought I was figuring some things out. And in some ways, I think I'm still figuring things out just a little bit differently now. Um, but at the time, I didn't quite know where I was gonna end up or what I wanted to do, but I liked it here and I wanted to stay a little longer. So happened, as life does, that right after that, I met who would become my wife uh, that summer. I started working in AmeriCorps that fall which led me to Stewart's Opera House, where I worked for as an AmeriCorps Vista for another two years, and then as their marketing director for 10 years after that. And really, it's that staying in Athens and, and delving into that community as part of my own development um, in, in my work and kind of finding my way that really sort of set me on this path. Um, it was at Stewart's and, and working with the Nelsonville Music Festival as well that I started to realize that the combination of different things that I was interested in could happen in, in varying ways, right? And I started to explore these ideas in my own mind and in some of the work we were doing there that I was lucky to be a part of in combining community development and nonprofit work. And also, of course, working at a historic theater, I became sort of the de facto historian and person who gave tours and organized history nights and tried to keep track of some of the old documents we had and things like that. And that world of community art, music, um, history, and, and really doing amazing things and collaborating with different people is where it really started to come to light at that time. So around June of 2019, uh, I did something that I recognize now looking back, may have been a bit of a midlife crisis or at least the start of one. And that was that I decided that I wanted to think about going back to school. And in June 2019, I did actually. So I started to think about it before then. And that was sort of based on this idea that I had a job that I absolutely loved. But I also had this itch that kind of kept coming up to start making things more on my own and start kind of diving into some territory that I had kept thinking about in the combination of these things. So I came back to school um, to figure some things out again, and I joined the MFA program at Scripps in the College of Communication. And it was sort of a natural fit for me. Um, I, I got actually the paragraph here. There's not a lot of text in my presentation, I should say, a lot of photos, but a little bit of text here at the beginning. But I felt like this was all very important stuff to give you an idea of where I was coming from. And that being that this program is designed as sort of an MFA media production program that draws from all of these different places, even in the schools that it works in. So those include the School of Visual Communication, Media Arts and Studies, and the J. Warren McClure School of Emerging Communication Technologies all kind of based in scripts and the College of Communication, but also in conjunction with the School of Fine Arts, um, and also just in conjunction with a bit of academic freedom to go and explore programs and classes and work, maybe that a normal media program would not have explored or a fine arts program wouldn't have explored to the degree that we were producing media, right? Um, so it's a three-year program where you develop creative production skills and you combine those with the context area. So this is kind of showing you how I got to where I, where I ended up. My context area is public history, which is specifically history that's focused on being out in the community and stories of people, place. Um, I love museums, I love history books, I love all of that stuff, but this concept of sort of history existing out in the community is always something that's very interesting to me and the connections that develop between local communities and bigger global and national events as a result. So that's my context area. And then I dove into audio storytelling and publication design, uh, graphic design as my production areas in my program. And the other thing about the MFA program I should mention is that a lot of folks come to it from being mid-career creative professionals, right? So the fact that I was uh, a little bit older, the fact that I had had this experience working at the Opera House um, and these other places was actually seen as sort of a benefit. It was, a, you know, when I was entering the program. And so that was something that made me feel a little more comfortable too about going into that world. So why did I come back to school? Well, I mentioned it a little bit already, but I wanted to answer in my creative work these questions that I was starting to have 
this question that had brought me back to school in the first place, which was how do I use audio storytelling and visual design to make people more engaged in the history of their communities? I wanted to create a project where an audience could go into these stories using different media formats, right? Um, at the time, I wasn't quite sure what those were going to be. And I wanted work that impacted my community directly, that these new media tools that I was kind of picking and choosing and pulling from and these things that I was learning about could be something that could benefit Athens, Athens County, Southeast Ohio, and more importantly, all of these people who have preserved these stories, who live this history, and who have it to tell. So I started a podcast and an idea uh, called Invisible Ground, and I started in September, I'm sorry, October of last year, and I've done three episodes, and it also turned into my thesis, which I'll get into in a minute, but I think it's important to kind of start with this here because this became a sort of a laboratory for me. Um, it was a chance to not only practice the skills I was learning with audio recording and editing and storytelling and sound, right? Um, and design, right? You see here, I have to pick photos. I have to think about logos. I have to think about how the branding looks. Um, but it gave me a chance to start going into the work full on. Um, and, and in a pandemic, it was actually a, a nice distraction in a way to be able to kind of really dive into this project. It gave me a chance again, like I said, to sort of I have a laboratory to mess with some of these ideas and to start exploring things. And so I did three episodes. Um, the, the podcast and my website is at findinvisibleground.com, but you can find the show anywhere you listen to podcasts already. So Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, uh, Audible, any of those kind of places. And here it is on Apple. Um, subscribe, rate, and review. It is not a lie. It really helps, especially for a graduate student who does not have a marketing budget for his podcast. Um, but yeah, you know, those things do go a long way. But you can see here, there, there was three episodes um, I'm working on the fourth at the moment. And the three that I did, I started with two cemeteries, West State Street Cemetery here in Athens and Mound Cemetery in Marietta. And then the last episode I did uh, about six weeks ago or so, the main feature was Tabler Town, which is a settlement in Eastern Athens County. Uh, and a few other kind of assorted stories were in that one as well. And I should mention as a nice little segue as we get into the photos, you're looking at a photo on the left here with West State Street Cemetery that is from the W.E. Peters collection. I'll tell you a bit more about him in a minute, but that is from the Alden Library Digital Archives. And that's the gate that's still there at West State Street Cemetery. Um, and then of course, Mound in Marietta is, was an interesting place because it is a historic cemetery, but it also has, as you can see here, a very large Adena uh, Conus Mound in the middle of it. So just to give you an idea of kind of the storytelling and starting to move into how the visuals and the research help me tell these stories and give them life, because that's kind of where I want to shift a little bit of my focus to. I've got a, other stuff to talk about as well, but this to me is where the research in the libraries and preservation of these documents and photos and stories really come into play. On the left here is another photo of West State Street Cemetery, also from W.E. Peters from that same collection. Um, this is actually looking at, as far as I know, the alley that runs next to West State Street Cemetery towards what, what you would know as First Street and then uh, Lancaster, which turns into Columbus Road. But it's just a beautiful photo. Um, a couple stones, obviously, in the left and foreground of the photo. But you can see it's still the same fence that's there, the hills in the distance. And then one of my favorite ones I found in the archive, um, one of my favorite photos that I found in the whole time in doing this is this one on the right of W.E. Peters, who was a local Athens lawyer, historian, researcher, surveyor, kind of jack of all trades, um, not master of none, kind of master of all of those trades that he jumped onto. And um, Peters, besides preserving a ton of history, he is the one who paid for the stones in West State Street Cemetery that have inscriptions and stories on them of certain individuals, including famous black uh, settlers of Athens like Andrew Jackson Davison. And even other, you know, amazing stories such as uh, formerly enslaved, you know, people who had arrived in Athens and changed their name all the way up to Silas Bingham, who was an early OU 
supporter whose cabins over across from the convo and who rode on the ship with George Washington across the Delaware. But you also might know Peters, and this is just shows how all these stories combine as well, the guy whose house is behind BW3 in Athens. So if you've ever wondered why there's a house poking out of there, that's W.E. Peters' house and office um, where he originally worked. And here he is on the right feeding squirrels in front of what I believe is either Chubb Hall or Ellis Hall in 1947. Um, I think it is Ellis, but then lately I've started to doubt that. But I find he, Peter shows up in a couple of his photos and I just find them fascinating because I think that, you know, 70 some years ago, um, here's someone that's taking a bit of a selfie in a way on College Green, just along with everyone else nowadays. The other thing I, before I get into my actual thesis and that research, I wanted to show you just one more really awesome thing I found in the archive related to West State Street Cemetery. And this one really combined all my interests. This was kind of the moment where I realized I was probably onto something. This is the Tombstone Tall Tales from Mrs. Grooms' seventh grade class at Athens Middle School. And it's kind of a zine about the cemetery. Okay, so how does this turn into a thesis project? Well, I basically wanted to figure out how to tell those stories of invisible ground using visual and multimedia elements. How could I do what I've done on the podcast and bring people in further? So. The thesis is an artist-led multimedia project that combines audio, augmented reality, visual elements, and place-based storytelling to engage people in this history. And I do this through augmented reality historic markers. So the idea is, is that you will download an app, the Invisible Ground app, go to a designated place where there'll be a sign that has a QR code on it that explains what's going on. You can zap that sign with your phone and then you will be able to access an augmented reality view of that historical site over top of your camera view. Um, another way to explain it is like Pokemon Go for history, um, is, is <clears throat> how I've explained it a few times, though obviously a little bit different, but the same idea that you're bringing these, this world into your actual reality through your phone and therefore you know, immersing yourself a bit more into the story. For the first marker in this series and for my thesis i'm creating this at the former site of the barry hotel on court street in athens uh, which is what you saw in that first photo so along with an overlay of the historic building i'll be playing short audio stories uh, which i'm developing that'll be there for the user to listen to those will be shorter pieces but beyond that they can dive in further to a full podcast episode more photos and resources and all of that will be on the website and it's a nice way to kind of have the podcast and this project move along together. Curric curriculum will also be developed for area students um, and I'm working with the Southeast Ohio History Center on this project and so they already have some programs that are wonderful with third and fourth graders throughout the county um, and I look forward to kind of having this which I think is an accessible way to you know get especially young people involved in these stories and in it, and realizing that the places that they walk by every day too contain a lot of history. Here's the site and you see the beautiful, there is a beautiful historic marker there already, um, but you know, it's attached to a restaurant at the moment. Um, it tells the unbelievable story of Edward and Maddie Berry, which I'll get to here in a minute as I show you the rest of the slides. And so it's a great marker, but you know, we're talking about a, a really impressive building here and I'm going to show you some photos from it that I've gathered from the libraries and from the archives and Tom O'Grady who's longtime director of the uh, Southeast Ohio History Center and still works very closely with them has always told me that the more you know about a place the more important it becomes you know the more that you have a sense of why something matters all of a sudden your view on that changes and it seems like such a simple concept but i i don't believe that it is i think sometimes people require a bit of a nudge to get there so i think the best way to show you the rest of this presentation and talk about my work here for the next 10 15 minutes or so is to really just start showing you all of these photos uh, and other things uh, newspaper articles clippings um, notes that I've sort of gathered so far. The tech part of this project is a whole nother fascinating thing. Um, I can thank my good friend and colleague Akbar Saltanov. Uh, Akbar has helped me a ton with the coding and augmented reality portion. 
on this project and making me make sense of that. Uh, that is the part that I was not as familiar with. I, I know a lot more now, um, but Akbar has been a huge help there. But for this, you know, I think we could do a whole separate one about how Akbar managed to make a building appear, and then I'm trying to figure out how to turn it into an app and a process that people can use. But I thought for the GRS that focusing instead on the research element of the storytelling and the project itself and the place was sort of the best way to give you a sense of why I wanted to do it this way. Um, visual storytelling to me is such an important method of getting across information. And when it comes to historical photos and maps, I think that they provide that same you know, connection to people. So let's look at some pictures, okay? These first few, oh, well actually here, this is me. Uh, after I uh, reached out to Bill Kimmock at uh, the libraries, thank you, Bill, you're incredible. Um, I got to do something that any nerd and any grad student and any lover of any topic that they're diving into uh, would be very excited to do, which is I got to go spend the day at the library. And what's amazing, I, I'm going to say this, I'm not just saying this because I'm here doing something for the library. They, that's what they are there to do. Um, <laughs> it was amazing. I talked to Bill about my project through email. Um, I had done some diving on my own into the digital archives, of course, over the years, but he understood my project and what I was after, and I got to show up there and have an appointment and be in a room by myself and safe and go through this unbelievable cart of documents that, that Bill put together for me. And so this is uh, a photo just of me kind of sitting down at that table of, of several folders and a ledger and a couple other things here. This photo I first saw courtesy of Ada Adams um, and I think it was also David Butcher, who's fantastic, uh, other resource for local history too. Uh, it was involved in some of the photos that he had and Ada had. And this is actually Edward Berry's 1893 ice cream shop. And I may have mentioned this before, um, but Edward and Maddie Berry were, were black. And I think that that is essentially a really important part of this story. Um, I bring that up because we are talking about 1893 here in, in a county in Ohio that borders the Ohio River, um, you know, that formerly bordered slave states. I think even further than that, both of the Berries, both Maddie and Edward, you know, their, their parents had been born enslaved in the South. And so there's a lot going on here. Um, and, and a lot that's really important in understanding both Athens history and these stories which are, are crucial um, in, to lift up in our community, um, but also in how we connect to these bigger stories of race and economic development and early black settlements, um, especially in Southeast Ohio, a place where I don't believe that is viewed sometimes as being a, a place that may have been as diverse as it was, at, especially at this time. And so this is the humble beginnings. Um, and I would argue not so humble based on everything I just said, but the, the beginnings of Edward Berry's business. Um, he made really good ice cream, him and Maddie. And they were of course both educated at the Albany Enterprise Academy as well, which is a black school in Albany, Ohio. And so you're really getting a generational change in this family where you're moving from enslaved parents who have managed to get to Ohio, have their children go get educated at this wonderful school in Albany. And then Edward here is then turning around, opening a business and becoming successful, um, developing wealth, developing status in the community. Um, now it's not all roses, of course, and I'll get into that. There's plenty of, of terrible racism and, and awful things that were happening, um, especially to Edward in the hotel, but it's a story of perseverance and of really generational movement that big change can happen. So that ice cream shop, as you can see here, gets a lot bigger and slowly Edward and Maddie, who both have a talent for all the parts of running this, this hotel and restaurant, keep expanding. And the berry, becomes known, not just in Athens and Ohio, but nationally. The hotel and Edward and Maddie end up in a book by Booker T. Washington about early black businesses. He becomes known as the first hotel to give people amenities, certain amenities at least, a sewing kit in every room, 
Bibles, these kind of things that like happen at every hotel now. The first place some of those things happen was the Barry. And this shot's great because there's two buildings in it too that are still at Court Street in present day. You can see the Presbyterian Church down there in the Athens News Building as well, formerly Athens News Building to the right in the photo. Each one of these photos too, you know, when you start to really dive into them, they really do transport you. There's people in here, there's transportation, there's change of the scenery around the hotel, right? And then of course changes to the hotel itself. This is obviously from, you know, I'm not sure exactly, but some sort of, I'm guessing a Memorial Day or a Veterans Day, um, some sort of celebration. You know, you have a lot of flags and, and scarves, things like that. I love this one just because of the, the men out front too, the woman on the balcony. And you can see some of this really intricate design in the building too. You know, these were not, this was not a, you know, modern chain hotel. You're talking about stained glass and balconies and intricate brickwork everywhere. And I might add wonderful typography on the on the window there. I'd be remiss as a designer if I didn't point that out. I love the Hotel Barry logo there. And I should say too, I got a lot of these from that the OU archives, but but doing a project of this nature, um, the library has been an incredible resource. But I mentioned Ada Adams, the Multicultural Genealogical Center in Chester Hill, Mount Zion. You know the people who are involved with preserving Black history in this area, and who are these these unbelievable resources um, for these. Just really, as I said, I, I know I keep saying this, but it's it, these are important stories, and and they're things that are important for people in Athens and people in our area to know. And I think, again, that there's a huge connection to these bigger issues. But also the Southeast Ohio History Center and Little Cities of Black Diamonds, you know, these are all places that were really helpful in this research. Here you see Edward and Maddie, Martha Jane on the right. I feel like I can call her Maddie because I've been spending so much time <laughs> in this world, but but I also know that if it was real life, I would call her Miss Barry. I would not call her Maddie. So it does seem to be very informal. Um, but even these are just incredible portraits of these people. And I have two other ones from later on. Here's the ballroom inside the Barry. I believe this is about early 1900s, I think 1908. Um, again, just an incredible photo. I think that visual storytelling and historical photography is an area that can be explored a lot more too. And it's something that's really exciting to me. Um, we all know that there's important historical photos. There's all things that, you know, have an impact, but yeah, the storytelling that's in these is incredible. So Two more things that I really liked I found in the OU archives. On the left here is a guest book from, from 1902 from the Barry. Um, and it's a real live guest book. This was not just a page from it. That is the ledger that you saw. It's handwritten, um, again, with just some amazing graphic design coming at it from that point of view, um, but also just an incredible document to be able to look with gloves, uh, go through something that's 120 years old. Here on the right is a menu from an event at the Barry in January 9th, 30th, 1930, right before Edward died in 31, featuring Sammy Kay and his 10 Ohioans. Sammy Kay, of course, going on to be a very famous uh, big band leader. This is really early in his career. He went to OU. Um, here it's listed as the 10 Ohioans, but everywhere else it's the Ohioans, and then it immediately changes to his group that he became more famously known by. Um, but it's just amazing to see the, the, the menu here. Um, the food, from what I've been told by people who have connections to, to the berries, um, but also what I've read in, in reviews and documents, the food was absolutely incredible at this place, at the hotel. And that, that, was, that food and the hospitality were really what I think led to its success. Here's an ad from 1938, um, advertising the hotel. You see it there up top with the big sign And this would have been after, obviously, Edward had passed. Um, I believe Maddie still owned it at this time, was not sold off yet, but you see them pushing the coffee shop as well in the set. 
here's another one of those photos that you know could be worth thousands and thousands of words um 1940s cocktail lounge at the berry with some very very cool stools <laughs> and uh, some intense looking uh people here it is in the 50s um again the, the kind of little accidents in these old photos um, I absolutely love this old Ambassador Laundry's truck. Ambassador's still on Stimson Avenue there, of course. Um, and you could tell, you know, this is a little bit more in the 50s, obviously, due to the cars and, and just kind of the, you know, layout. And it looks to be around Christmas, too. And I found, I'm going to go through these a lot quicker as I kind of start to wrap up. Um, I found a lot of articles, too. You know, the, the amazing thing about the Barry is this history has been recorded many times um, you know I should say it's very important for me to note that I'm just trying to amplify these stories and approach them through another format give them another way to exist you know I, I am not inventing the wheel by any stretch and I come here literally um, on the coattails of people who have devoted their life to this work um, to help give a new presentation of it that's it and so I came across so many wonderful articles and people um, you see here, you know, that were all in the archive telling this story. Um, and it was a story I was familiar with, of course, before I got into this, but the detail, um, each one of these, you know, each one of these magazine or newspaper articles um, contained some element, something that was new, um, something that gave a little bit more personality to the story and a little bit more character to everybody. Um, and it was really, really fun to go through. I can't stress the fun of it enough. Um, and it's been hugely helpful in thinking about my audio stories and my work and how I want to present this. So getting a little bit ahead of myself, maybe let's go to this first, actually. Um, the, the, and you see the berries here a little bit later in life in the photo in the bottom right, uh, Edward and Martha Jane. But you also see Mount Zion Baptist Church up above it. And the berries organized and helped to raise money to build Mount Zion. And from what I understand, also, don you know, Edward donated a lot of money towards that cause, but also was really important to you know, rallying people behind it as well and raising more money. And it is there, you know, Mount Zion is again, an unbelievable place. And you should all find out about all the incredible work that they're doing to preserve that building and its history. And beyond that, turn it into a black cultural center here in Athens, it's much needed. But thinking about it, even in that term, you know, going back to these are, these Edward and Maddie, obviously later in their life at this point, but are children of enslaved people who have built a successful business and they are now taking that money that wealth the generational generational wealth they have and putting it back into a space that's needed and necessary for the black community in athens and i find that to be a pretty incredible story of a few generations and for those familiar with mount zion the house next to it the beautiful brick house on congress was the berry's home which they also built um, after that. He sold the hotel in 21, and they built the, the house there right adjoining Mount Zion. And I've heard some wonderful stories about this place too. Um, Martha Jane lived there for many years after uh, Edward's death, and it is now the Phi, Keta, Phi Kappa Theta house. Um, and they've preserved the history, they've maintained it. Um, there's Edward and Maddie again. And then in closing, kind of the last part of the Barry story is, you know, the unfortunate one. Um, well, this we get into that here. It's why it's not there anymore. And so it it becomes, you know, it, after Barry sells it in 21, it gets sold to a syndicate. It eventually gets sold to another group of local business people. And I must point out, too, that um, one of the most devastating and also one of the most least surprising unfortunately things is that right after um, it is sold by edward berry that hotel goes back to being a whites only hotel um 
So you talk about local stories and the impact, the things that a small story can tell you about American history, right? And to me, I think you can sum up a lot of the terrible um, way that we have treated people of color in this country by hearing what I just said, that this, this man um, and his wife, against all odds and against the face of racism, managed to build this amazing business and this community and not even weeks after he is not in charge of it anymore, um, it is a whites only establishment. After eventually that doesn't work, um, after so many years, the hotel you know, falls on harder times. It's eventually acquired by Ohio University and they turn it into a dorm. You see here on the right is the plaque for it. Um, and that's a whole nother part of this story. It's one that I'm not going to get into a ton in here. This is John Enlow on the left. I don't know who John is, but I had to include this photo. It might be a little blue for an academic presentation, but these are from a scrapbook of the residents of Barry Hall from the late 60s. And again, totally separate from Edward Barry and the black history part of this. It's kind of amazing to see how college in 1968 is a lot like college in 2021 or 2001 or 1975 or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of photos of, of guys partying and hanging out with, with ladies and probably drinking too much and playing a lot of sports, but also, you know, this sort of competition between halls and dorms and for sporting events and extracurriculars. You see here, because the Barry was a dorm that had a ballroom and a restaurant, they would have bigger events. So there's President Alden at an awards banquet there, and that's in the Barry, in the ballroom. But it, this book was also fascinating because it just showed that, you know, this, this building had so many different lives. Here's some more photos of, of the students in the Barry. And then, of course, you know, um, that ran its course. Uh, it was a very old building, you know, they had had sort of, you know, it was not built to be a dorm. I think that it had worked for a while, though you didn't need the space anymore. Um, and they wanted to get rid of it. And as with most things in a small town, that becomes kind of complicated, right? So I'm not going to get too much into that today, but this was also something that was very fascinating to see in the archives and I think told an important part of the story. The city eventually buys it um, and works with OU to purchase it. You know, there's there's debate on council about what to do with it. They wanted to make it a parking lot. Um, so, yeah, I could say some things about that, but I think you know how I probably feel. Uh, you know, these are the reasons why I want to see this building come back to life, even if it's through an augmented reality app, right? You see here on the right, that's the uh, rubble uh, from the site. It's being sold as a commercial lot at that point. And these two photos are pretty incredible too. Um, one, we had a Belk. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but this is, this is um, would be right where the parking lot's located across the street now um, on the right. And those are doors from the hotel, which are pretty incredible, just leaning up against there. This photo on the left is on Schaefer Street. I believe that's the hospital in the background. So they actually had so much rubble from the hotel and the building, they had to have a separate site. And then they had information as well on the plaque unveiling and the wonderful um, ceremony involved with it. I'm going to take questions here in a minute, but I felt like while it was kind of quick, it, it was a good way to get everyone an idea of, of how research and photos have informed my story and kind of how I'm trying to use that to make this project more real. Um, I'll leave this up for a minute as we gather questions and people kind of get settled, but I do got to give the few quick thank yous and plugs. You can find it, my podcast, as I mentioned, on findinvisibleground.com. It's also on Apple, Spotify, Google, and I have a Patreon page as well. If you're interested in supporting the project, you can find out more there. I want to thank Ohio University Archives and, and all of their associated collections. I see a misspelling here, um, as well as the Multicultural Genealogical Center, Ada Adams, David Butcher, and Southeast Ohio History Center for the photos. My thesis committee there. Thank you, Josh, Julie, Tom, and Chip for always uh, giving me guidance and help. And I want to thank, as I mentioned, everyone involved with putting on this presentation and all of you for coming. 
And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jen and also get ready to take some questions, I think. Thank you so much, Brian. That was that was fascinating. So we are going to open it up for audience questions at this point. Um, we've got two options for you. If you'd like to use the raise hand feature, you're more than welcome to. And then you know I'll call on you. You can unmute yourself and ask Brian your question directly. Or if you'd like to type it in the chat, I'm more than happy to moderate that. Um, and we actually already have a question in the chat. Um, so we're wondering why, if you had come across anything um, indicating why the city didn't consider keeping the Barry as a historic landmark building yeah i mean <laughs> there's a lot in there uh in those articles I, I delved a little bit into it i have to be honest of you know i think sometimes when you're trying to tell something as broad a story that was a part that i i didn't go into too much yet um also maybe that's part of the historian block right is that i'm like i kind of know the story right it's no knock on the city or anybody you know it was that it was in bad shape it would cost more to fix probably than it would be worth um and again you know it's the 70s in athens 60s and 70s in athens are a very different time than now um this this town and this university were exploding with with people and i'm not in any way justifying what they did but i think that that parking um instead of you know a four floor um dilapidated you know older hotel was probably more of a concern unfortunately mm. Yeah, I'd hope we do it differently now, but I also know I, we probably would. Not, I would hope so too. Uh, so we have another question in the chat: Is do you have an ideal audience for your thesis project? Um, how can your project be incorporated into the classroom? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think that is my ideal audience. I love the idea of young people um, of relating to this. Um, I think history sometimes can seem like a very distant thing. And part of the podcast and part of the approach I've taken here is I really want to connect those dots for people, people in the community. But I think students are a great way to start that. Um, you know, I think that it, I, the AR component, uh, the app part, the tech part, the audio is sort of the shiny carrot in a way. It's a way that makes it exciting for um, young people, I hope at least, um, especially in this case with a building that's not actually there anymore. Um, and as far as curriculum, yes, it's, it's a huge part of doing this in the classroom. And so I have lots of background in education. My undergrad was in social studies ed. I teach a lot in my MFA. Um, so that has to be a part of it for me. So I am developing curriculum uh, for, there'll be a curriculum for the Barry Hotel site that will get through the History Center, will get out to the third and fourth graders in Athens and in the county and anyone else who wants it, frankly, you know, adults too. Awesome, thank you. Okay, uh, Lorraine, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I do. Um, Brian, that was just fabulous. Brian, did I see you do a gig in Shawnee? Was that you? Okay, it wasn't you. Um, Maybe, um, I'm known to do gigs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't wanna uh, show my ignorance here, but so folks were cool about staying in a hotel that was run by African-Americans in the late 1800s, turn of the century, do we know, like, it just seems like, wow, people were accepting. And then, as you noted earlier, it turned into whites only. And I guess I would need to delve further into my history research to see, like, what was that schism that made that happen? And I was curious, so whites didn't have any problem with the fact that the owners were black at the time, or is their history saying, well, they might have had a problem? So I'm just curious. It's complicated. I think it's probably the easiest way. It's probably also super complicated. I'll give the disclaimer, you know, as, as a white man in 2021 talking about what I might perceive that to be. But I do think that probably as often when it comes to racism and, and issues that stem from that, you know, um, I would imagine some folks were fine with it like you're saying lorraine that maybe they're you know at, we think of athens as a progressive place it was not always like that it, you know um but there was always still that element you know there there were people there were black students being accepted to ou there were people here in the community in the black community who were doctors and lawyers and key, strong community members at the time so it existed you know um and was accepted and 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 was there to some degree that being said i think sometimes probably for people maybe that were more racist than that, it would be viewed as the exception, right? I think sometimes that's kind of the rule, like, oh, this hotel's nice. 
but that's not how I feel about everyone else. And that's really unfortunate. Um, and it gets what I mean by the complicatedness is not only the racism there um, and the history, which is super complicated. But I think even among the berries, you know, Edward, I think he wanted to be he was obviously you can't separate those two things. But everything I read about him, he's such an, a genius businessman, an unbelievable worker and a visionary. And I don't think he wanted to be seen as a black hotel in the way that he just didn't want that to be a gimmick. Uh, I think he saw himself as having one of the best hotels in the country, black, white, blue, green, whatever. Um, and so there's an element of that too. You know, he was always behind the scenes and everything I read. Um, and I think that was because he was that kind of person. But I also think, you know, um, that was how he approached the business, if that makes sense. But yeah, I think it it's, it shows the complexity of time and it shows that, I'll tell you what too, the 50s, 60s and 70s in Northern states are, who you wanna see some racism. So that doesn't surprise me that after all of that, that it would have been a whites only hotel. That's why, you know, it's, un, it's very unfortunate. I think it's horribly ironic, but it is America, unfortunately, I think too. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So while I'm waiting for another question, um, I'm going to drop a link in the chat for our audience um, to a short survey about today's program. I did share earlier the direct link to Brian's website, so you should be able to scroll up and find that. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a minute and just letting us know what you thought about today's program. Um, and we'll wait for just another minute or two and see if we have any other questions coming in. In the meantime, I want to thank you so much for such a wonderful and engaging um, presentation. That was, I, I learned a lot this morning and I really, really appreciate it, Brian. Thank you. I'm always glad to talk about this stuff. And so I think I was telling uh, someone on my committee the other day, I think sometimes when you work on this, it's very insular. And so it's cool to hear questions and talk to people about it. Looks like we have more. We do. We have uh, Miranda. <laughs> did you want to ask your question? Brian, thank you for this excellent presentation. Um, I'm curious if you could say a little bit about how you feel like projects like this and this media work can help to bring visibility to the next set of decisions that communities and universities are making, um, because it feels like you're bringing to light some really key issues and ideas about our reflection on history. But um, do you have any thoughts about how we bring this forward and have a forward looking lens as well? Yeah, that's a great question, Miranda. Um, you know, I, preservationism comes very quickly in this story, you know, I mean, in this project and the approach to it. And so I think that there's potential, you know, I'm exploring, I should mention too, the, the plan is, while I, I have to give the huge disclaimer that I am working on this one for my thesis, and, and that's the focus right now, the plan is to hopefully keep doing these. And so that community interest and the development of those stories and reasons for doing it will continue but i think you hit on it which preservation and having knowledge right the education of of what is important in these spaces and why is huge in telling those stories and, and bringing to light those things and so even in the podcast you know even separate from this visual and ar component i am trying as much as i can to focus on stories of of that don't get told as often or maybe don't get told in that platform as often so stories of people of color of women of lgbtq communities um labor communities uh immigrants and the working class um so i think the same approach is true with those buildings and that history you know that there's a lot wrapped up in all of those things the stories and those people i think go back to what i mentioned about tom tom's quote uh, of more importance, right, of knowing something. I think that's kind of it. To me, I think that this new technology can be something that can make younger people more interested. Um, it brings it into a way, you know, um, it's no longer in the museum. It's no longer something that will get them to the museum, I think, eventually. I think that that's the other thing is that an act like this, that's something you can look at for 20 seconds at a building and find out what it was and what it did and even listen to slightly longer audio pieces and then dove into a podcast. And then all of a sudden the hope is, you know, in a perfect world, the perfect audience, um, you're at the history center and you're in the, in the library, you're looking at photos, you're, you're out at 
David's place in Tabler Town, looking at his incredible artifacts. You're giving money to people like MGC and, and Mount Zion because those are the people that are doing that work. But I, I think you're right. I think the, the my hope, you know, without sounding too full of a project that hasn't happened yet, is that this causes people to look at their these spaces um, and what's important in their community differently. Yeah. All right. Well, we do have a couple more questions, and I'm sure cool. more than one person is wondering this one. Uh, how can we help test the augmented reality work? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, all seriousness, that will be happening soon, and I need all sorts of people for that. Uh, um, I'm hoping that by the end of January, early February, um, there's, you know, it'll be version 3.0 by then or so. Um, but that there'll be something where I can do some test runs because that's the most important. Um, it could be the coolest idea ever. It could be the coolest tech ever. I could be the greatest storyteller ever. If you point this thing, your camera at this building and, you know, nothing appears or a big X appears <laughs> or you don't hear the audio or something doesn't seem intuitive, you know. So for me right now, I'm really heavy at this point, um, have been for a little bit, but now really focus in this next month or two on that user experience on the design of how someone is going through this. I have lots of sketches. I've done a little bit of work, but I'll be heading into that soon. And so if you're interested, reach out to me um, either through my OU email or uh, findinvisibleground at gmail.com works too. You just go to that website, message me on Facebook, uh, Instagram, and I'll make sure that when it's ready, I get it to you. I just will ask you lots of questions in return about how it made you feel and if you got angry. <laughs> All right, I think we have one last question here in the chat that we have mm -hmm. time for. Uh, let's see, with your research, have you found any large gaps within our, the libraries, uh, digital archives where you've had to go elsewhere to find the information? Um, yeah, but that's to be expected. I think, you know, the cool thing about the OU archives is that because this was a university building, because it was a building of prominence in Athens, you have a lot of information about it. Um, not just from the photos and things that I saw, but it's mentioned in the W.E. Peters, you know, in papers. Um, it's mentioned in other places. There's this cool dorm book. That being said, talking to Ada Adams, talking to David Butcher, talking to uh, T4, talking to all these people who were involved with Mount Zion and in really essential people for black history in this community has opened up the rest of the stories. You know, that's when I'm hearing Ada tell me about how her, her mother knew Martha Jane Barry. Um, and when she graduated from OU in the 30s, she would go went and visited her. When she had her kids, she went and took them to her. Um, we hear about David telling me that why his wife's ancestors and relatives worked at the Barry, right? Um, you get those little bits. Pete Katzis, who ran Athens Bicycle, um, told me that his dad was a professor at OU and ended up with the mailing system in the psychology department, I believe, the mailing system from the Barry. Um, so you get the, those are the things you get elsewhere. Um, but this part and what I showed you is really that essential foundation of kind of understanding the timeline and what it was, where it was, who was involved. Um, and so that's sort of that foundation that then I can start to build like, well, what are those stories? What are those connections? What else am I missing? Yeah. Excellent. Well, I think on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up for this morning. Um, thank you again, Brian. It was it was wonderful, and, and I look forward to speaking with you again. Yeah, thank you, too, and thanks, everyone, for coming to this. Um, yes, this thank fantastic. you, everyone. Yeah.